Good morning and welcome to our chronological study Bible study. We are in Epoch 8 because we skip from the New Testament during Advent to the Gospels and the story of the birth of Jesus. And it's been interesting so far, and I think it gets more interesting and culminates next Sunday with the, with the most interesting things of all, but we've got to get there first. So I'd like for you to join me, join me on page 1091. This is Matthew 1, uh, we talked about this briefly last week, and I'm not going to go through all of these names, uh, I never do, but we talked about that Matthew begins his story of Jesus with the genealogy of Jesus the Messiah. As we talked about last Sunday, if you remember, it was very important in those days for people, especially men, to be able to notate their genealogy, to tell their genealogy. And for some reason, it's a little, a little un, unspinown, um, it, it is usually written in 14s. So 14 names, block, 14 names, block, 14 names. I'm not exactly sure why that is, but but that is, you know, that's something for one of you who would like to to look up and, and inform us next time. Um, so, in transition, the genealogy of Jesus begins like First Chronicles with the genealogy, the first gospel. So Matthew is the first gospel. It begins with a genealogy, just as First Chronicles does. This account of the ancestors of Jesus Christ sets the story within the sacred history of the people of Israel. As Abraham's descendant, Jesus is identified as a Jew. As David's descendant, he is located more narrowly in Israel's royal family. Matthew's account follows Chronicles, but omits some generations apparently grouping the descendants into sets of 14. The mention of four non-Jewish women. You know these names. Tamar, Rahab, Ruth, and Uriah's wife anticipates the gospel's conclusion, which calls for the evangelization of all nations. Numerous attempts have been made to account for the disagreements between Matthew and Luke's genealogies. It will be coming up. Some have proposed that Matthew provides Joseph's genealogy and Luke's Mary's. But Luke's descent describes Mary as related to Elizabeth from the tribe of Levi, while placing Jesus in the tribe of Judah, making it improbable that Luke's genealogy is actually Mary's. Probably the discrepancies between the genealogies arise from the different sources used by the two evangelists. Again, we've talked about this before. Don't get sunk in that. Don't 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 get don't get sunk in that because you'll you'll spend a lot of time trying to figure out why they're different and so forth. And it really doesn't matter. And it doesn't matter because why? Because God in the Bible does what? Has a plan. Has a plan. Thank you. And also. Tells us what we only tells us what we need to know. So why Luke's was different than Matthew's is really insignificant to us. Um, we have the names. What is important about Matthew's is what I mentioned that it sets the story of sacred history, sacred history within the people of Israel. Then it sets Jesus identified as a Jew because he's a descendant of Abraham. And then, as David descended, he's more narrowly in Israel's royal family. Once in royal David's city, you remember the hymn? You'll hear it. If you have it, you will hear it soon. Once in royal David's city. So I think this is the important part of this genealogy. We don't need to read every name in it. What's important is that it sets for us Jesus' place in sacred history. Uh, why is that important? Because later when we say that he comes from the royal lineage of the house of David, you will hear that a lot, especially Christmas. You'll hear it around Christmas. You'll hear it at other times. This is where they get that, from Matthew's opening chapter of his gospel. That's where they get this. Nowhere else. So, after it reads all of these, just verse 16, it says, 
Thus, there were 14 generations in all from Abraham to David, 14 from David to the exile in Babylon, and 14 from the exile to the Messiah. So three groups of 14. Uh, we already have talked about when precisely Jesus was born. <coughs> we went through that right here, so we're not going to go through that again. Um, so we've changed the page now to page 1092. And um, and it's interesting because this is where people have tried to... There's a lot of work on specifying Jesus' birth date. At the end of the day, what does it matter really? If he was born in April or he was born in December. It really doesn't matter. The people who believe he was born in April, as I told you last time, believe in a, um, they believe that it comes from one of my favorite things. Agriculture. I just love agriculture. It's really <laughs> And so, they, they say the shepherds would in December in, outside of Bethlehem it would have been in the 40 degrees. The shepherds wouldn't have been out there with the sheep. It's not, it's not the right time. It's not the right those of you who are sheep people might know something about this but I know nothing about it other than they, the people who were there the people who teach it say there are a group who think that because it was not the right time because it was too cold they would have been closer in to where they lived they would have been putting the sheep up in wherever you put them up in sheds, sheds. 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 very good very nice they would have been up in sheds <laughs> yes and so they would have been out as it describes in the in the birth story out in the in the middle of nowhere you know out in the pastures where the angels appear that's not that would have been unlikely because it was just simply too cold it was just a, a basic thing it wasn't any magic to it it was just too cold so if they say that wouldn't have happened then they say well when would they have been out like that they would have been out there during the spring, and I've been told by people who delve into such things that the spring is what happens in the spring. The babies. The yes, the, the birthing of the, the lambs. Lambs. Mm -hmm. Is that the ewes? The ewes are the mothers, the lambs are the babies. Thank you. Thank you. We have the to have the these people here. <laughs> so we have the spring. Well, this was the first global warming. <laughs> there you go, the heart. There, there you go. Don't let that get you mad. Because <laughs> it would make me mad. So, so out in the spring, they would be out in the pastures, and the people would be, the, the sheep herders would be watching for the birth of new life. And so that's why they say Jesus was born in the spring. It's just, it's not any great calendar event. Now, other people, Josephus is one of them, says the Gregorian calendar skipped. It skipped what? What did it skip? I told you last time. We talk about it here. We have it every once in a while. Leap year. Leap year. Yes, Deacon. Leap year. And then, if you do the research and, and go back and look at some other sources, and I've done this, I've done this part, you will see that there is a difference between this calendar and other calendars of about three years. There just is a difference. Again. Really, who cares? It, it, it's insignificant to what? It's insignificant to what? 
Is he did get to what one thing? What, what was the question? When Jesus is born is insignificant to what one event, one thing? Uh, he was born. The fact that he was born. Well, yeah, but it was well. It was the time of the census. Salvation. 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 So salvation happened, and all those things you named, I heard. I heard John say, resurrection. And somebody else said um, uh, crucifixion. And some so any of those any of those things lead to or are part of what event? Salvation. Salvation. Why is this will be a little you get you don't get you get extra for this, no no extra charge for this. <laughs> Why is the story of Jesus? What is what is the story of Jesus called? What do they refer to it? This is more of a seminary question, but it comes up from time to time. If you're hearing somebody like Bishop Dobbs, he would use this phrase. I would not, but he would use this phrase. Good news. What you say, Salvation history. That is a big phrase among people like smart people like Bishop Dobbs, unlike your poor priest here. Bishop Dobbs would say something about the long, sweet. They like, the, they like these phrases. I'm telling you, they like these phrases. <laughs> the long sweep of salvation history. They will talk about that either in a room like this or during from their sermon. The long sweep of salvation history. Sometimes they include Old Testament in it, the prophets. They include the prophets like Isaiah, who prophesied that there would be a Messiah come. You're familiar with that. And then other times they don't. But they always, always, always say the story of Jesus was the story of salvation history. Isn't that cool? Mm -hmm. Pretty cool. So, it doesn't matter. Somebody said it right. It, uh, uh, well, Tom said it right. It doesn't matter when it happened. It matters <laughs> that it happened. <laughs> That's what we have to keep our eye on. That it happened. When he actually was born, whether it be in December, within three weeks, they've narrowed it down for those who believe in the, in, in the Josephus' way he looked at it, or it's the, the people who take the more agricultural view of it. And there are other, there are other, other many ways to look at it, by the way. I mean, you, there's a, a million people who have a million ways to look at it. Uh, they will say, they will say, that it's here and it's here and it's here it doesn't matter what matters is that we know he was born this is this part right here that we talked about last week is pretty irrefutable and why is it irrefutable because it is of holy scripture holy scripture tells us that there were three Passovers in the Gospels. Now see, you wouldn't know that. You wouldn't recognize that. You see what I'm saying? That, that's not, if we, we went, when we go to this, and we go through this eventually in, in full, if I'm still alive and you are, we will, we will talk about it and we'll say, well, here was one Passover, and then in another Gospel is another Passover, and there were three. And Jesus says, adult life, three Passovers. So, during the Gospels, which have to do with, I mean, there's very little talk of Jesus as a child. Very little talk. It'll be, we know that we know next to nothing about him being a child. Interestingly enough, 
it will be three years because there was a Passover each year in the Gospels. There was a Passover each year. Three, and he was 33 years old when he died, and he had three years. So you back it down. You back it down. And so there was three months difference between what? John and Jesus. That's right. So John the Baptist, you say John the Baptist. So that's right. So we come over here now. I wish I could just kind of hold off and do this. But we'll do a little of it right today and then finish it up next week because it's pretty busy next week with, with what we're going to talk about in here. So if you if you talk about Matthew and you talk about the genealogy of Jesus and then you talk about the birth of Jesus, then you, then you get into at the bottom of page 1092, there is a, a paragraph or several paragraphs that talk about the trail and the trouble. Trouble. In trouble. And it is between Mary and Joseph. Now, engagement in those days was much different than engagement is today. Engagement today is just says we're going to get married. We intend to get married. We intend to get married. And we'll set a date. And in the meantime, we're going to have a lot of parties and we're going to get a lot of gifts. And, you know, we're going to do that. In those days, engagement meant that you were formally engaged to be married. They really didn't let you have much contact with your soon-to-be spouse. It was a year long, and it was, a con it was a contract that began. The clock was starting to tick. Does that make sense? So let's talk about marriage for just a minute. Uh, you all want to talk about it. Can I sit down? Do you mind if I just sit down a little bit? Can you see me still? <laughs> okay. Well, thank you. Well, I'm enough. Thank you. So let's talk about marriage. And I say this at weddings I do from time to time, especially weddings where I haven't had a chance to talk to the people. And I, I used to do a lot of those. Don't do too much of them anymore. But anyway, there are two ways to look at marriage. Two ways to look at marriage. One is marriage is a contract. Fair enough. And guess what happens? And then let me do it this way. There is a contract. And other people look at marriage as a sacred covenant. We've talked about covenant a lot. You all are great examples of the sacred covenant sort of marriage. I've watched you. I've watched John take care of Molly. I've watched George, take care of Carolyn. I've watched all of you. I've watched all of you. I mean, you know, you, you, you do that. And we have other people who aren't here right now. We're st it's still out on you, Mark. I'm not sure about you yet. We're going to see what happens when the time comes. Yeah. Oh, I know she'll take care of you. It's, it's, yeah. We're worried about the others. But here's the thing. If, if you view marriage, if a young couple, if a couple, use marriage as a contract, then what do you do about contracts in the real world if you don't like them anymore? We go to court. Yes, you get an attorney and you dissolve them. Simple enough. That is how when, when people look at marriage as a contract, they think, well, I'm going to enter into it. The state or the city is going to give us a license. Not God is going to put his ordinance or his hand on it, and it will be then a covenant. And then, and then, if I don't like it, I hire an attorney like you would do for any other business-like organization, business-like contract. It's no different than any business contract. And you hire an attorney and you break the contract. That's the marriage that that's marriage that ends like it does so often. I should have renewal like a car, new sticker every year. Well, okay, a renewal sticker. Okay, I'll let you get up and explain that in church. <laughs> I'll let Mark get up and give that theology. Yeah. I'll pass on that one. But good, good job there. Uh, <laughs> Now, in the Gospels, Jesus talked about divorce. 
did he not? I know we're going afield here, but I think it's good. So he talked about divorce, and he gave reasons for divorce. And these reasons for divorce allow a lie. In the Old Testament, especially in the first five books, especially in the Torah that the Jewish people use, especially in the last book of the Torah, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, there are, and others, the rabbis study those, and those are what are used as guidelines for what's called in the Jewish people. What do they call when they get a divorce? They call it a get, G-E-T. They call it a get. And to get a get, you have to be approved by the rabbi to get this divorce, this get. We're not that way, unfortunately. Well, not that I want that job, but you know what I'm saying. We don't, you know. So why is this important? Why is this important to us? It's important to us because of the permanency of how we view things. If it is a covenant under God, then it is a different thing than if it's a contract under man. Now, some of you are probably thinking, oh gosh, he's talking about divorce and I got one. Guess what? I got one too. You know, actually I had the right reason to get one, but that's a different reason. That's a different story. We're not going to go there. Here's the thing about it. I just, this has just come to me in the last months, really months. We mature in our Christian life, don't we? Are you the same Christian you were 20 years ago that you are now? I hope not. Not because you were a bad Christian then, but I hope that because you have, and all of you have, faithfully come to church, and because you have studied the Word of God, you're here in a Bible study, you hear the Word of God, you hear the Word of God explained, exegeted, is that what they call it, it's the official name for it. You hear all of those things. You hear the words of the hymns that tell the stories. I would hope that and pray that I have a better understanding of Christianity and of Jesus and of being a Christian and what that means than I did 30 years ago or 15 years ago even. I, there is no question that right now I understand being a Christian better than I did the day I was ordained a priest. There's no question about it. Why is that? One reason is, for me, and like you all, for me, I've had to prepare hundreds and hundreds of sermons. And I've learned more about Holy Scripture by preparing sermons than I ever learned in seminary or I ever learned in Bible study. However, I will tell you that I have learned, what's the right word? exponentially more in our Bible study about the Old Testament and now about this than I ever knew before. And I hope you have too. Because we've never done it. We've never... It's going to be unbelievable. Having said that, am I a more mature Christian than when I married Cynthia? Yes. Do I understand what God's picture for me? What God's what? Plan. plan. She's not here, so she has the right to say it. The plan is for us, for me, for you. I understand that more now. I understand what to do and how to do it. I'm not always still very good at it, but I understand it better. So I would tell you that for the, before you take on whipping yourself and saying, oh, my God, well, I was divorced and I shouldn't have done all that stuff. I would say the Bible and the, in the revelation to us of the way the look how the Bible is written. What comes to us almost three quarters of the way through the Bible, the Gospels, or more than halfway, the Gospels. We wander through this great detailed Old Testament 
we'll about we're about to start the we're almost ready to go to the great stories of the kings kings first and two and chronicles and all of those things then we'll come to the prophets and then the old testament will end with the prophets and then 700 years later here comes jesus the lord and then after jesus we have people paul mostly who wrote most of the uh, uh he wrote most of the epistles yes thank you to explain to us the gospels and not only to explain it but to hammer it home paul is like a big sledgehammer in me mm -hmm. when you think of what paul writes i think of him as a huge sledgehammer he just man he tells you what to do he tells you how to believe he tells you what you've heard he wants to make sure there's no wishy-washy part of it and i like that james does the same thing when james talks about how we how we talk and use our mouths and how we deal with other people and you know on and on and on well he's talking to me and i understand it i understand it better because he's hammering it he's hammering what jesus said home he's talking to me not like jesus talked to us he's talking to me like i would talk to me so we haven't gotten there yet but i would tell you not to over overly worry about what's gone on before now don't worry about that worry about how you are as a mature christian now would you make the same decision would you understand this things the same way? Would you respond in the same way? Would you, you know, and maybe the answer is yes, because Jesus said this is how you should respond no matter how old you are, no matter how much understanding you have of it. But for people like me, I would tell you I understand how to deal with things a lot differently through having studied this and who having matured as a Christian than I did some time ago. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So where we thought of it as a contract, here's where I'm coming to, whereas maybe when we were young, yes, we went to the church, we went to our mama and daddy's church, and we mm -hmm. got married, and it was sweet, and you know, we had the pretty flowers, and we did all that stuff. Now, and we thought we were doing the best job we could do, we thought we were doing the best thing we could do, didn't we? I mean, nobody gets married and thinks it's going to be a disaster. I don't think. <laughs> Sometimes you might have a clue, but you go ahead with it. But I think that's the issue. We, we, we thought we were doing the right thing. But it was sweet and cute and whatever. But guess what was missing it? And we had a minister who said a few words, and we didn't even hear him because we were so... He, the men, the women were all, couldn't wait for the reception and for all the people to tell them how what cute they looked and how beautiful they were, and the men couldn't wait for the wedding night. Okay. That's right. I'm just telling you. That's right. Is it not? Tell me I'm wrong. <laughs> okay. Yeah, exactly. Well, there was that. That was for people who lived up in, you know, yes, you're right. Yes, you're right. Waiting for the reception and the booze. Which led to the wedding night and a disaster for the women. Um, having said that now, uh, I think that we've learned a lot and we are able to apply it in a lot different way, aren't we? So, not a contract now. We're living under a sacrament. We're living under a, a, a fulfillment of, of an agreement between God and man, not between man and man. And that is what is, that's what's known as a mature follower of Christ. When we, and that's what it says when we say, let's put Christ first in our lives. We're not saying, I'm not somebody who thinks, like some people I know and I'm very close friends with, who think that everything's to this vantage point of looking at everything the way Christ would. I just think that we start to look at things in a way that we should as a mature Christian. And here's what's hard. I find hard. See if you find this hard. In 
if you look through things as a mature Christian and others don't, mm-hmm. you have this, you know, don't you? You have this tension. That's what causes a lot of problems in life. I'm talking about just in not marriage, but now in general life. You're work, you're work, you're living on you're working on one plane and they're working on another, and it's tough, isn't it? It's tough. So, married is working on a completely different plane than her other people because Mary Sunday. I want to get back to Mary. Mary is doing that because Mary is living on a plane where the angel of the Lord Gabriel has spoken to her. So her maturity in the Magnificat, you hear it, her maturity as a Christian has been accelerated like 40-fold, 100-fold, pick, pick the number you like, because she has been spoken to directly by an angel of God, which is the same thing as God. So that's right, that's right, Jenny. Mar- and John, uh, her husband, will get talked talk to in the same way here in a little bit next Sunday. We'll hear from him. He'll get talked to by the, the angel. He will say, take the woman. Don't let the people push you around. Don't let them tell you to get rid of her. Take the woman. Keep the woman. Because she will bear the child of the Most High God, and you will be forever blessed and honored. So he, 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 his maturity is a Christian accelerates untold amounts. So that's sort of the story today. The story today of Mary, really, and I don't say this in my sermon, I'm saying it to you all. The story today of Mary is a story of Mary accelerating in her maturity as someone following Christ. Because before her, guess what there was? No Christ. No Christ. She was going to bring Christ into the world. But at, but she accelerated her understanding. She could have just been this little girl, 14 years old, who had a baby, and then she just said, I don't know what about this. I'm, this angel came, and I'm turning it over to whoever, and I'm done. Think about it. She didn't have to embrace this child. Joseph could have said, I'll marry her. And we're going to do it, but then we're going to give this kid up for adoption because we're not going to do all this stuff. And that's not what happened. God spoke to them through the angel Gabriel, and they became different. They, at young ages, understood something that we take we take decades to understand. When you hear the Magnificat today, when we say it, you will hear a 14-year-old girl Proclaim the greatness of God. How many 14 year old girls or boys do you know who will proclaim the greatness of God? Not many. Not that they're not Christians, but will they understand it to that degree? Will they do it? Will they be that faithful? It's tough. But that's why we celebrate Mary today. We celebrate Mary from this chronological study Bible through our service because she at 14 or 15 or whatever she was, this young maiden, it says, allows this baby to leap in her womb. Leap in her womb. And she knows it. And she gives thanks to God in the Magnificat for this baby who the angel Gabriel has said will be the savior of the world. It's a magnificent story, really. It's a powerful story. It's not just a Christmas story. It's a story of faith. It's a story of mature Christianity. It's a story of love. It is a powerful story, much more powerful than the fact that we're going to sing a few hymns and on Christmas Eve, and we're going to have, you know, Smells and bells and crowns and gowns, and we're going to love it all. Yes, but what we're celebrating is not just the birth of Jesus, but we're celebrating this powerful change in the way some people understood God and His working and His plan. Thank God.
I'd be with you this week.